Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 21 of Learning Outside the Lines with Colin Glenn or Glenn and Kyle. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. Not at all. We've got a really exciting guest today. We've got uh, Brandon Myers joining us, who's the manufacturing teacher at Maxwell High School of Technology, which is located in Gwinnett County, which is the district that me and Glenn serve in. Um, but what he's been doing has been particularly uh, powerful, and we've shared a little bit of it in Twitter threads here on the show, uh, where he's part of the bigger movement of trying to develop PPE equipment for healthcare workers. So we're excited to have Brandon with us. We're going to bring him on in just a little while with what's the good word, but let's go ahead and kind of get into what's going on in life. Glenn, what is up, sir? Uh, well, um, life is, life is, life is complicated today. Life is good today. Um, I'm just, I'm just super excited about, uh, honestly, we've got like two weeks left, two weeks left in the semester. So that's kind of, kind of my focus is just like focusing on, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. And, um, you know, just, just really looking forward to, uh, winding, winding things up, I guess. Um, you know, with the, with the school year. How about you? What you got going on today? Well, the fun thing I kind of wanted to share today uh, has to do with, so we had a, uh, one of our former guests does a podcast called Chapel Bell Curve. Uh, yes. should, be, should be no mystery whatsoever that I am a uh, giant UGA Georgia football fan. And, and I love this podcast. They do advanced uh, stat, stats. Um, mm-hmm. They haven't had anything to talk about since the end of the season, but yeah. That being said, they recently did a Twitter thread that is just an absolute delight, especially if you happen to be an English teacher or appreciate Shakespeare in any way. So I wanted to show everybody um, <laughs> this little uh, this little snippet from a thread that they recently did. Um, listen, I need you all to pay attention because today I'm going to explain to you why Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet is an extended metaphor for the politics of college football. Now, I'm not going to take the time to read this all to you, but for those that are looking at the screen right now, if you just want to like preview just a couple of the parts of the thread, it is worth your time to read. Honestly, whether or not you like Shakespeare, it is phenomenal. Um, <laughs> I just I got a really good laugh out of it uh, today when I was looking at it, and I think he makes a pretty good case for for the metaphor uh, flowing, uh, to, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I like, I'll, I'll scroll down a little bit in case people have read a little bit more. Um, I mean, it's it's the perfect tirade is what it is. I, yeah. I think Tybalt is pretty stuck. So I would definitely agree with that part. So I like this explanation of the two lovers then or the two fan bases that have this sort of passionate admiration for each other. Like, yeah, they're rivals, but there's a spark there, and it's hard to deny. This is basically every other SEC team's relationship with LSU. (laughs) So anybody who enjoys the sports ball um, and misses it a little bit like I do, um, this is that was that was a pretty delightful thing to get into. So I wanted to share that at the beginning of the show as something that was kind of fun. Uh, That being said, let's get into the next part of what we always do, which is our digital teaching hack. Yeah, no, just real quick, though, before we transition, his vocabulary is unbelievable. And uh, every single time I read something that he writes or just just listen to him speak, like uh, talk about someone who is a wordsmith in their own right. So um, just to just to kind of go back to Anchor, which is a tool that we've been using quite a bit. Um, they came out with something really interesting uh, lately, which you've you've dallied with a little bit now. Um, which is super exciting. Let me find the tab. Okay, so uh, what is it doing here? Edit, edit, edit. Yo, 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 I don't care. Well, that's all right. While you're getting that up there, we are using Anchor currently to put up this as a podcast. So we redid our episode with Bobby Gway as a podcast. That was our third episode we ever recorded. It was the first one that we ever actually had a guest with us. So you can check that out now on Anchor. It's on Spotify. And we're going to keep trying to put these out in that format too. But just be patient with us because it'll take a little bit of time to put them all up. Yeah. And so that's actually kind of what I wanted to share. Um, and, and maybe like you talk a little bit about how easy it was to do, but I just found out that anchor has now made it to where you can take video chats, like literally exactly what we're doing right now. Um, and turn it into a podcast. 
So it already had this wonderful ability, and this is something I've been working with students on, is you can already take any audio file and just kind of shove it into your podcast. Um, but they've now expanded the different formats that Anchor can now take and adapt. Um, and what uh, one of the things too that makes Anchor so attractive for building things is this library concept where every little bit of your uploaded content gets stored in that library that you can then pull out, remix, um, refeature, and uh, it, it just, it doesn't get lost, which I think is fantastic. So how difficult was it to turn our, our, our videos into that podcast? Well, because I was a new user to Anchor, I just had to get familiar with the way the interface worked. But at the end of the day, the work itself was not difficult. Um, you know, I wanted to explore the different options you had for transitions and putting music behind, you know, pieces and stuff. That's actually one of the things that's nice about doing the podcast version versus this version. We do very light edits to this when we put it on YouTube with yeah. the anchor option. You can very easily slide in some nice background music. Uh, the transitions are pretty easy to, to throw in as well. So for me, it was time consuming the first time around because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so yeah. I'd, anybody who's willing to take about 30 minutes and take something that they've recorded on video and upload it, you, you get familiar with it pretty quick. Because I imagine doing future episodes will be much easier to transition with. Um, I, I liked it. The only thing I couldn't figure out, and Glenn, you might be able to tell me this, is if I wanted to like take that uploaded audio and shorten it or take parts of it out, that's the only thing I couldn't figure out how to do. It seemed like you were kind of stuck with whatever you uploaded and you could split it, but you couldn't really delete audio. You can, there is a way to chop. Yeah, you, okay. you, you can chop and hack. Uh, Anchor, their editing stuff is almost like a, like a hacksaw or a machete. It's not, there's not a lot of finesse with it. But, um, you know, I, I can show you a few tricks. One of the other things I love about Anchor too, just while we're pausing here on, on their site, is the fact that um, they put out really good videos that basically walk you through almost anything. Um, and I've been able to use a lot of those videos in my own classroom to help students, but this is this is just a 20 second video that, that kind of walks you through exactly what we were just talking about. So pretty cool stuff, great company. And I, I love that they do that. So just wanted to share. And also yeah. check out our podcast. That's going to be an exciting new addition to our um, our media line, our brand. We're going to need t-shirts, Kyle, maybe some hats. Right. You know. Yeah. Well, yeah. and, and I, here's, here's something I'll actually share really quick too that I think is uh, worth kind of throwing out there. If you haven't seen it is our district actually put out a podcast. Um, it's it's okay. pretty new. Um, I just saw it for the first time the other day, but they're up to five episodes, um, and it looks like they're using Anchor as well to assemble it. So I'm wondering if maybe it's somebody who's paying close attention to what you're doing, Glenn, to be, that's to be funny. honest. That, that's really funny. No, I mean, it, it's, it's a pretty big deal. I'm definitely not the only person doing it in Gwinnett, but that, that, that's really cool. Yeah, that's yeah. So just something to kind of be aware of that, you know, this is a space that even our district has entered almost out of necessity or another way to connect right now. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's get into our really exciting uh, guest. So Brian, Brandon Mayers is a uh, friend um, that I've gotten to know here in the last, uh, I guess, almost two years. Uh, when I first met him, I was still at Lanier, and he was coming in to help the robotics team at, uh, at Lanier at the time, and he was still in industry. And then um, he had so much fun, he decided he might as well teach and be with kids full time. So joke's on you, Brandon. No, I'm just kidding. Brandon, I'm pretty sure, loves it. So yeah. we're, uh, we're going to bring him on, but he has been running the manufacturing program that we just started about two years ago, bringing all that industry knowledge into to it and just really what he's done in two years to that program is pretty extraordinary but one of the reasons we wanted to bring him on outside of talking about his program is the work he's been doing during this time to still engage his students and also help at the larger scale of what's going on and so uh, weeks ago he started the process of helping develop PPE equipment for healthcare workers with the tools that he has um, and so we're going to get in a little bit into that as uh, as well all right so Brandon I'm going to I'm going to get you back up here with us. Woo! Hey guys, what's going on? What's up, Brandon? I also got to point out in the live recording here that Brandon, again, has a nicer setup than we do when it comes to recording. <laughs> so yeah. he's, uh, he's well prepared. I tried my best. I tried to bring a professional touch uh, to at least my third of the, today's episode. 
Yeah, it's it's great, man. And we're really excited to have you have you. So, um, so in our what's the good good word segment, this is our chance to kind of get to know any guest that comes on. We've been talking to different people in the edu sphere, and we haven't had a whole lot of CTE teachers necessarily join us. Career in Tech Ed, uh, which is the world that I support. Um, so you have a very interesting program that you started to develop at Maxwell and you've had a lot of fun with it from what I can tell. Uh, but give us a little bit about your background first. Like what did you do in industry? What made you make the crazy decision to become a teacher full time? Tell us a little bit about your story. Uh, it's, uh, I have a very uh, crazy story, I guess the entire time it's, I've made decisions uh, in my career that have been in that same vein for a long time coming out of high school. Uh, I had initially joined the uh, seminary for the Archdiocese of Atlanta. Uh, and as one does. As one does, as they do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that did not pan out very far. Actually, it was very entry-level stuff. And uh, uh, eventually worked my way into uh, taking classes at Linear Technical College. It's one of our local technical schools where I learned about machine tool uh, technology and using CNC machines and equipment like that. Uh, which led me to a job working for a, a local motorsports uh, and an exotic car manufacturer. So I, I built race cars for four or five years. Yeah, uh, it was pretty cool. I I joke um, I joke with my family and other people that I, I haven't had just a normal job. It's been nothing but a string of dream jobs. I went from building race cars and celebrity sports cars. Uh, I then for the last 10 years before this one worked for a company – uh, here in the Gwinnett area that was servicing uh, the nuclear energy and, and petrochemical industries. Um, so a lot of uh, very extreme, very high budget, very uh, critical type of work that we had to do. Uh, and that was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And then, yes, I got I got pulled into this almost exclusively because of uh, the work I'd done at Linear High School with the CDAP program and with Mike Riley. It was he suckered me into this and now I'm hooked. And and yes, <laughs> I've had it's, it's our second year and I've been having a great job. I joke with everybody that I am I'm just a guy who came out of industry. I just know how to make things. I make brackets all day. And, and I have no idea what I'm doing as a teacher and everybody is, is just telling me, no, that's probably exactly what we needed. So that's fine. Yeah. And, and it's been good. It's been really good. I'm, I'm having a great time. There are, yeah, there, you're, you know, you're doing it right as a yeah. teacher, if you don't actually know what you're doing, because I, you're, you're doing things that like you're growing along with the kids. And I think it's, that that's, yeah, it absolutely feels that way. Absolutely. Yep. That's cool. Yeah. And, you know, and, and really you came into the classroom doing the right stuff, which was just building relationships, right? So if you start with the relational piece and they know they can trust you and they know they can come to you with their confusions or what they're worried about or what they don't understand. Um, every time I've been in your classroom space uh, in your lab, um, it doesn't seem like a kid is, is really, well, I mean, they might be a little afraid to ask the question because they don't want to sound dumb. You know, they're right. working with pretty high skill stuff in that room, right. but you're very, very welcoming. Um, and that is a huge first step for any teacher, whether they're coming from industry or they were classically trained. Uh, but, you know, it. I also remember in early conversations with you, you took a lot of your management experience from industry and were able to apply it to what you were doing um, in the classroom, too. So it was interesting to see some of that kind of slide in. Uh, before we got on, I had asked you to kind of send some of those, like, documents and things that you kind of created. Um, so real quick, kind of before we get into the meat of the conversation around the PBE equipment, what what did you kind of take from industry that you pulled into your classroom that seems to be working? Uh, you know, it's, I, I don't see the classroom, honestly, any different than, than someone in management trying to manage uh, a department full of employees, um, especially in a CTE uh, type of environment, in, in a career in tech ed. We are trying to teach these people and these students how to operate in the kind of fields that we came from and that I came from. So my entire goal has been to teach as though these were employees that would have been working in my manufacturing shop. And this is what I feel that they need to know. And these are some of the skills that I feel they need to have. And high on that list, along with their actual technical skill set, was uh, a set of leadership skills. Um, one of the things that I, I follow is a book by Jocko Willink is uh, called Extreme Ownership. And in his methodology is to empower everybody on his team to have an extreme ownership of the mission. Uh, he was a, a Navy SEAL commander. So he, 
he would not break it down by being the person who would micromanage. And I've worked for micromanagers. We've all worked for micromanagers and we know how painful that can be. So I've tried to introduce to them an opportunity to be able to survive in an environment where they're working for someone like that, but also to become naturally become the leaders in whatever field they go into. And that's just going to, to guide them. Um, and, and we, we teach them some of the leadership principles. And at the same time, while we're teaching them the skills, when they get down on themselves or when they get really proud of themselves, uh, we also try to teach them, Hey, you know, hone your skill, be the best at what you do, money, success, it follows. It comes along with it. Just continue to be, if you're going to be a machinist, be the best machinist, the rest of it just falls in place. And, and so far that has been a successful strategy for me and hopefully for them too in the future. Well, one thing I want to show real quick with that, and, you know, I wasn't expecting you to talk about leadership, but, but how key is that? I, I love that that's the integration to the program, but I also wanted to share uh, some of the stuff that you sent me, like this, this, uh, this word document for instance where how you kind of like lay out and map your lesson plans mm -hmm. um lesson planning is something that teachers know is a necessary thing they have to do but they typically don't enjoy doing it and then on top of that i've met plenty of teachers who just don't really do it outside of like a sketch um but i felt like when i talked to you in your first year of teaching this was like a way to survive uh, right. to have yourself organized and be ready and not that everybody has to do it this way but I was so struck by when you put the spreadsheet out in front of me for the first time. It's like, hey, am I doing this right? And I'm like, uh, yeah, you're doing this right. <laughs> nope. um, the, the, the stuff I took from this, uh, it's, it's all project management type type tooling. You know, when when we're trying to manage a, shop, a, a project in a manufacturing shop, there are stages that everything has to go through. We have to source the material. We have to speak with the customer. We have to complete the engineering design. Uh, there's review meetings. There's all these types of things. And it just seemed like they naturally integrate into just what would be an education ease version of that is just that's what the lesson plans seem to be so that was kind of the approach i took was was the same way i would manage a project i had our large milestones and within each milestone i would break down smaller ones but i i did learn through the end of that year to simplify a lot of my my goals and kind of blanket them in larger spans to give opportunities for that. What are they called? The diversified learning or whatever the specific term well, is differentiated, but really That's mastery it. too. Right? Like, yes, we can set goals. And sometimes like I imagine again, when you don't have a classically trained pedagogical background, you're like, Oh, well, the 20 something year old that I work with in the shop could meet that goal in that amount of time, but my 15 year old can't. And yeah. that's okay. I just have Definitely to adjust. Not. <laughs> Sometimes a twenty year old can't do it either, but yeah, yeah that's that's entirely true. Um, a lot of a lot of what our curriculum has evolved into has been focusing on very large uh, project based opportunities and in that project being you know serving two purposes, one hitting so many of the standards and so many of the opportunities for them to hands on learn the skill they need to learn, and on top of that, trying to make sure that it's something that's just a little bit higher or harder than they think they possibly could achieve you know something so where they say proximal development proximal Ooh, vygotsky you're throwing some vygotsky out there yeah 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 i know but i mean it's solid stuff you just want it to be like that's how you grow so right exactly like, brandon's face about. was perfect there he was like i don't know who you're talking about i have no idea <laughs> so so in educate in education or whatever vygotsky is a big deal i mean he's a russian theorist that that created uh, some of the stuff we still use today my own dissertation is foundationally based off of uh his theories right like at the okay. very very base of it and one of the many that he has is that zone of proximal development um where you are basically the idea is that people can learn if you stretch them a little but if you stretch them too much they'll give up Tr and if you yeah. don't stretch them enough they'll never learn and that's the that basic idea behind that that theory right absolutely that's been my experience it was my experience in industry and it was the same has been my experience in the classroom uh the great example is the the large project we did last year was to build a full-size arcade machine from scratch so we made a retro six yeah it's a six foot by three foot by three foot true two-player arcade machine and which I'll be buying one day. I will yeah. buy one of these. It's Which <laughs> there's there's three of them sitting in the shop waiting right now. Everything's just kind of dead space now since we had to abandon ship. Um, and and a part of that project, uh, I also brought in part of my leadership principle, which is to be not just honest, but to try to 
understand a humbling level of honesty too with them where if I didn't understand something or I don't understand something in the shop, I gladly tell them, I have no idea. That's a great question. We should figure that out together. And this is how most of my projects are run. And that's how that one was. Uh, they all asked me, how are we going to do this? I have no idea. So, but we're going to figure it out. Yep. That's cool. Um, yeah. So, well, let's kind of get into one of the big reasons we wanted to bring on, which everything you just said was, was a ton of fun to talk about. Um, and, and I do, I love that arcade game, uh, cab and I, it's, it's in my dreams on a regular basis. Um, <laughs> But what we really wanted to bring you on for is we had initially been inspired by the process you started to go through where the need became abundant that we were going to be short supply for PPE for healthcare workers. And right. so why not try to make an impact here locally? So just tell us a little bit about what initially inspired your pursuit to even get involved. Uh, it's a super easy question. Um, I stole the idea. 100% took it. You're a teacher. Um, as You're I'm a full bona fide teacher. <laughs> yeah. As all great ideas are. Uh, it came from collaboration. The it, we, we were seeing people doing it, but I didn't really click that we had the potential to be involved in the process until uh, I spent more time with, with Mike Riley and uh, the CDAT people at uh, at Lanier mm -hmm. High School. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it was incredible. They had already had an idea in their head that their facility would be a great opportunity to provide PPE and it kind of clicked in my head, I want to be a part of this. Yeah. And even more so, it just worked out that we had just completed a project that was the perfect fit for what we needed to do to be a part of this. So you really started with the the ear relievers was like the first, the, the first thing I saw you kind of advertise that you guys yep. were building. Why yeah, did these you, guys right yeah, here. there you go. Why did you start with those? Uh, well, what had happened was, you know, we needed to find a way to keep the students involved and to be a part of this. Now, the key part of them being a part of this project was we built we built a 3D printer farm. Now, some of the news reports we've gotten have been unfortunately been misquoted, but it is a farm. We took not just one, but six 3D printers, networked them together and set up a virtual server where students could access and actually queue machines to keep them functional. Um, we started with the ear relievers. We reached out to uh, a website started by the National Institute of Health um, and started having my students look at some of the products that were clinically approved that we could manufacture. And they started picking out items they had. One of them was to do the ear relievers. And at the same time, I have a friend who uh, is a medical professional and actually had just offhand mentioned, my ears are killing me at the end of my shift because we have to wear a mask all day. And I said, well, wouldn't you know, we're going to try to do something to help with that. And it just grew from there. It took off. So um, well, real quick, from a functional standpoint, how do the ear relievers work? Because when you just kind of show it, it's, it's mm -hmm. hard to kind of maybe envision it. How, how yeah, is it supposed to work? It's hard to visualize. So this is a super flexible plastic material. Um, it's PLA plastic, which is a bio-organic plastic um and what happens is normally when you're wearing face masks you know they loop over the back of your ears mm -hmm. instead this presses against the back of your head and the loops will loop into here instead and it keeps the pressure on the back of your head instead of on the ears so they can either wear them lower underneath the ears or straight over them right. or right on top of them and it, and it relieves a lot of the stress from having to wear the mask all day yeah, yeah okay. ears are really sensitive yeah yeah it's it's <laughs> they're they're she showed yeah. me she was she was telling me about the bruises uh and the the damage you know she was feeling from all that so yeah. it can be long-term damage especially with um you know when when you're not when you're never getting a chance to take your mask off and it's a constant thing that you have to keep on because you only have maybe there's they're in short supply right um yeah it's yeah i i just wanted to ask because you know I, I think people see the strip of plastic and they're like well that's nice but how does it work so i appreciate it, the the explanation um, you had mentioned the idea that part of this was wanting to keep students involved so take us right. a little bit deeper into that how have students stayed engaged in the process of this production as best as possible considering they're having to do whatever they can from home right it's it's been especially i mean it didn't help that this was the kind of thing that hit from so many angles this being my second year uh, so I'm only kind of feeling like my feet are wet enough to be you know, able to stand on my own. Uh, and then a lot of what my program, I pride my program on is that we are extremely hands-on from almost day one. Uh, our classroom, we have a small classroom and we have a lab. I tell all the students, the lab is where you start your day. Going into the classroom is where we go if we have to. Um, and so then to take that away and go into a virtual climate is, is very difficult. Uh, thankfully, 
we had set up a lot of this stuff where every every project we seem to do the students and it's working every time i push them a little bit harder they try to find the next level and they're naturally trying to find the next level and that's what happened with these we found we had our printers that were provided and they said well we need to do more and we need them to work together better so we built the six machine farm they said it would be better if we can get them to communicate with them remotely so we started setting up raspberry pis and setting up a server so they could be done remotely and then they said it'd be even better if we could do it super remotely and actively queue the machines individually based on who needs to run what project. And I said, you're right. So we found a company out of California that was willing to work with us to beta test the software that does exactly that. So we were in the process of going through, I guess really alpha beta testing, a fully functioning cloud system for this 3D printer farm where the farm was almost just sitting there needing an operator and the students were running this stuff from their home schools, from their R class, from everywhere. So when this came up, I simply told them, log in and let's get to work and queue up what we need to queue up. Um, and we had planned to go further with that where we were gonna uh, assign project managers for certain shifts and I would just be the button pusher. I have no no problem being, you know, taking the humility and saying, I will gladly be the one to, to clear and start your machines. You just tell me what to do. Uh, and then well. it worked out that one of the people told me what they wanted and then obviously one of the local hospital systems reached out and that that kind of kept things moving in a different direction yeah i mean that's you know i mean it doesn't get any more authentic than that and that really bleeds into your leadership principles right like you've right. had for almost an entire year at that point when this all went down said all right time to put some of the stuff we talk about into practice and i'll be the the button pusher and yep. you all lead the projects i mean it's it, it, it appears at least looking at it from the outside uh, that is working it's it's been great i think so definitely and then recently you started doing uh shield work right so now you're doing some of the face shield work um, yes sir yes sir um so we we got a hold we got to uh speaking with one of the people at northeast georgia health system they're uh, a local uh center here that has a couple hospitals and multiple physician physicians facilities here in north georgia um they had a layout for a mask that they had already approved through their doctors that they just needed people to make and when i mentioned this to my team i i asked them and this is how i refer to them my students is they're my team i said listen northeast georgia reached out to us they'd like us to make these i want you to look over the design if you think we can do it let's do it and some of them came back and said yeah this is absolutely we should do it so they decided we needed to shift production over to the face mask so we started shifting those over last week and started making those all right so um i i'm just I'm kind of blown away. So one of the questions that I had queued up for you centered around like the idea of what what did your industry experience kind of help you prepare for this kind of project? And I think some of that answer is probably pretty obvious, but I'm so, what I'm struck by in all of this is that you are uh, so outside of the education space that you didn't even get caught up with the idea of, well, gosh darn it, I don't know if my kids will do it. I don't know if I can trust them. I don't know, if, you know, all the things that teachers typically go through when we don't want to release them to make or do the thing that does right. not seem to have been an issue here. So I'd love to hear that, maybe that connection about industry experience and how this was, I mean, you just, yeah, run with it, kids. Let's go. Uh, I think one of the hardest, uh, one of the hardest skills that we have to learn, I, hands down, I think the hardest skills we have to learn in industry are soft skills, just the ones where we're able to interact with each other. Um, and then even more specifically, how we can get into a position of management and manage effectively and know that we're trying to manage people, not manage jobs and manage, you know, uh, a person with a name and not a, a number, an employee. And one of those is delegation. I think, honest to God, is the ability to delegate. It was something that was difficult for me to get through and to take on and learn early on uh, when I had the opportunity to lead a few people. And as I grew further into that, I realized that the more I took off of my plate, and it's funny, I, I, I have a couple students in each class that are acting as my project managers and shop managers. They run the entire shop in their shift of the day. Um, and a couple of them would tell me, I don't, I'm not doing anything, Mr. Myers. And I would tell them, well, then you're being an effective leader because yeah. an effective leader will fully delegate everything they need and give the people the skills and, and, and the tools that they need to do what they have to, to get to the end goal. And your job is simply to facilitate. And I haven't treated what I've done any differently. I just imagine the project is that they need to learn how to be effective in the shop, how to be safe and, and how to you know, grow in the standards that they're supposed to grow. But at the same time, I think, you know, grow as successful, productive 
you know, Americans or human beings even. And part of that is just the same as I would with one of my employees. Got to have the trust to let them do what they need to do and just be there to support. True words. Yeah. yeah. Very, very cool. Uh, <laughs> that's, that, that's amazing. <laughs> You know, and I'm just thinking about some of the some of the big scale projects that that I've done in my classroom or, you know, other teachers do. I think that there's a lot to learn here, um, you know, and not and not think about your classroom as a classroom, you know, not think about your students as completing things for grades, um, you know, and just just more focusing on what they're learning beyond, you know, you're talking about learning things that aren't just how to how to operate a machine or how to work right. a computer. You're talking about things that, like you said, are soft skills, and that translates to everything. Um, so that's huge. That's that's really cool. We have little little tidbits that occur throughout the class, and one of them is after the first month. Uh, the students aren't allowed to ask me what's next. They're not allowed to come up to me and say, "What do you want now, Mr. Myers?" They always have to come forward with either to solutions to whatever the problem is they came up with or to pads that they want to move forward. So if a machine is clogged up and you know, let's say the nozzle's jammed and they need to fix the machine, they can't simply say the machine's jammed, what can I do? They need to come to me and say, the machine's jammed. I think the nozzle has gotten stuck. I want to go ahead and take the nozzle apart so I can see if this is going to fix it or something like that. They have to have some type of process forward. And, and that's that, I think helps grow them into that direction. And sometimes you either have to push them harder into understanding it's okay to think a little further. And some of them you have to throttle them back and say, okay, you were supposed to bring me a couple of the options and let me choose not, you just go ahead and run with it. So it still comes with its own problems on its own, but um, just in the scale of what I feel like is a success, you know, Maxwell is fed by all the high schools in the county. So I get, students from what you would consider every click. I have football players, I have engineering students, I have them from every world working together, finding their place in a manufacturing setting. Um, and our second semester, we essentially, the shop goes live. We limit the lectures and we almost go to the point where the students are responsible for taking real customer orders, completing parts, speaking with customers, sourcing material, writing POs, everything that they would have to learn in real industry. I think this year was a great example. It was our first test of it. And after January 6th, up until we left in March, we had completed and fulfilled 24 separate orders for different things they wanted designed and made. Wow. Yeah, that's it was pretty impressive. Huge. Yeah, no, that's awesome. It reminds me a lot of just talking with someone else from the CTE world um, we, when we had Keith Phillips on, just talking about some of the some of the similar things here about what makes a successful project-based classroom work, um, you know, and kind of building everything on the front end and really just making sure that you're getting those those rituals and routines is what we call it in, in the in the school world. But getting those getting those um, you, you know those, those ground rules built like that community built in the beginning and then just basically reaping the reaping the benefits. From, from all of that hard work on up front. So. Absolutely. Well, for today's outro, um, I'm actually, Brandon, going to let you help me with it. Uh, I'm okay. may have to uh, disappear on us for a second here, which is fine, uh, but we'll at least get into this. So one of the things that you ended up uh, sharing with me was where all this stuff is being collected in case someone wants to get in on the creation of the PPE gear. So let me right. go ahead and, and bust that out for us. Cool. Um, so Brandon, tell us a little bit about, you know, this, this site. So you, t you referred to it, the, the U S uh, Department of Health and Human Services is mm -hmm. doing this. So what's, uh, what's on the site that people could find if, they're an engineering teacher, a okay. teacher with a 3D printer, so forth and so on. Okay. Uh, well, you know, the doctor that we see in every press conference with the president, Dr. Fauci, this is his organization, the National Institute of Health, and they've created what would be a COVID version of Thingiverse, where people are submitting their designs and their ideas. And I think if you scroll down a little bit further, uh, you can start to see, yeah. So some of them here, they all have different icons that mark them as items that can be made. And the ones that have that green marking, the National Institute of Health has, has actually put it through clinical testing. 
and they've shown that yes this is okay for you to go ahead and make it as long as you follow the instructions um so this has been a great resource it's where we got ours actually if you scroll down you can see right there on the left that's the beginning of our file that we found right there the surgical mass tension release band and um it's they have the files you need they have the sources you need with instructions on how to make it and this is i think this is a great starting point because it makes a good central location everybody's coming up with their own designs these are the first ones that i found that have actually gone through an extensive official testing um so i think it's a great source to to find what people might need awesome well um you know, you can you can find it here. So the the website proper is the 3dprint.nih.gov, uh, um, mm -hmm. and then you can kind of go from there for those who are looking for it. So, hey, Brandon, thank you so much for joining us, man. Absolutely we really appreciate it. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and sign off. So for those of you that had continued to watch and continue to check out what we're doing, thank you. And we're, we welcome uh, more guests. If you are reading this and you think you have something to say about your experience right now in education, let us know. And in the meantime, you can find me on Twitter at, at the Prof Jones. And then, uh, Brandon, I don't know if you have a way you can get people to connect with you, but I imagine you might get some questions. Absolutely. We're on Twitter at Manufacturing HS, and we're also on Instagram at Maxwell.Manufacturing. So you can hit us up at either one of those. Very cool. All right, everybody out there, stay safe and stay healthy, and we will catch you next time. See you guys.